Hey guys, I want to remind you to check out CF Capital. CF Capital is the premier boutique real estate investment firm in the Midwest and Southeast region of the United States. We are a national real estate investment firm with a purpose. We provide property investment and asset management solutions to help passive investors maximize returns on high value multifamily communities. But our investments go far beyond acquisitions. We invest in people. We are in the business of elevating communities and raising the bar for everyone within our ecosystem. CF Capital is a real estate investment firm focused on the acquisition and operation of multifamily assets. We confidently deliver tax advantage, stable cash flow, and capital appreciation with a margin of safety. By investing alongside our team, investors can preserve and grow their wealth without having to deal with tenants, termites, or toilets. Investors come and stay for the outsized returns we create in our deals while appreciating the ancillary opportunity to make a bigger impact that only CF Capital can provide. If you're an investor and want to invest with us, here's how. Learn more about CF Capital at cfcapllc.com or by simply clicking the link in the show notes of this episode. We will see you on the inside of this powerful community. So let's elevate communities together. So the ultimate goal, the long game is to get all the money out and still own the building. It takes a long time to do that, but um, we, we've successfully done that. We just did it on a deal in Salt Lake. We've owned eight years where we returned all the capital and then some, and it's been cash flowing like crazy. And we still own the building, the slot machine that perpetually pays. Like one of my mentors was telling me about a building he bought, you know, maybe it was 20, 30 years ago for 3 million bucks. And every year now it returns 3 million bucks. He got his original, maybe put, let's say 25% down or even a third, a million down. Like he's gotten that back multiples, you know, over, over the time. It's just the law of compounding and, you know, utilizing, you know, real estate as, and letting the tenants pay down the mortgage and time and inflation and rents growing over time. And you can't have any wipeouts in real estate. Welcome to Elevate the masterclass where we dissect the elements of exceptional achievement and lifestyle design with a focus on personal growth and real estate investing. Now, here's your host, Tyler Chesser. Elevate Nation, welcome back. This is Tyler Chesser. I'm so thankful to have you here and I'm blessed and grateful to be sitting with Keith Wasserman today. You are going to learn about how compounding can serve you and change everything about your real estate investing journey and how you can lean into delusional optimism, paranoia, and the inability to quit. And also how you can make the next decade an unbelievable transformation and one that maybe you are not even able to understand how powerful the next decade can be. Man, this is a great, great conversation. One that I'm, I'm going to be revisiting uh, many, many times. And I really enjoy this. And I, I definitely want to encourage you to buckle up because today's episode in today's discussion is transformative and one that there is tremendous, deep generational truth within. So I'm so excited to share this with you. Elevate podcast is all about mindset, mind expansion, and personal development for high performing real estate investors. I'm your host, Tyler Chesser, and I'm a professional real estate investor and entrepreneur. It is my job to decode the stories, habits, and multifaceted expertise of world-class investors and other experts to help you elevate your performance and lifestyle. Are you ready to take it to another level? It is time. Let's raise the bar today. We are absolutely sitting with a world-class investor, one that has built a humongous and tremendous track record across the country as a real estate investor in various different asset classes, but one who's built tremendous scale. So you definitely want to listen closely to this episode today if you want to develop tremendous success within real estate, but also within your life. I mean, there's a lot to be learned from this conversation in terms of being a dedicated father, dedicated husband, a great friend, someone who is generous with your time. You know, it's not just about building wealth and, you know, it's definitely not about being selfish. And so I I think that really comes through in this conversation today with Keith. You're going to love this. Uh, I'd love for you also, if you have not done so, to give us a rating, review, and subscribe or follow Elevate Podcast on wherever it is that you listen or watch podcasts. By the way, we are available on YouTube. If you want to watch this episode, Uh, feel free to hop over to YouTube right now. If you are there, you can also listen on any of the podcast platforms. And this conversation is so great. So definitely buckle up. And while I get you strapped in, let me introduce you to Keith Wasserman, who founded Gelt in 2008 during the height of the recession and financial meltdown. Keith has now been involved in the acquisition of multifamily and self-storage properties worth over $3 billion, mainly across the Western United States. 
He oversees the company's operations, marketing, investor relations, acquisitions, leasing, development, and disposition services. He graduated in 2007 from the University of Southern California and the Marshall School of Business, and he sits on the board of the USC Lusk Center. Keith leads Gelt's charitable giving program and recently teamed up with Damian Langer to form the Resident Relief Program, a 501c3 public nonprofit whose focus is on helping renters avoid eviction upon unexpected financial emergency. Keith is also the member of YPO, Tiger 21, and the Milken Institute Young Leaders Council. Without further ado, please enjoy this phenomenal discussion with Keith Wasserman. Keith Wasserman, welcome to Elevate, my friend. How you doing? Doing well. Thanks for having me, Tyler. Absolutely. No, it's it's tremendously my pleasure to have you. And I've been looking forward to this conversation for a while. So appreciate you making time. And I know Elevate Nation is going to receive tremendous wisdom from you today. And while we dive into this episode in this conversation, I'd love for you, if you don't mind, to share a little bit about your your upbringing, your backstory. Of course, we'll talk about, you know, what happened and, you know, as you were founding your company in 2008 and, and the trajectory there, they're moving forward. But talk to me a little bit about your upbringing and your backstory. Yeah, so um, I'll do pre pre business days. Um, yeah, I grew up uh, here, born and raised in Southern California in Los Angeles, sp- specifically the San Fernando Valley. Um, I'm a unique breed in that I'm born and raised here and uh, not a transplant. So um, yeah, my whole life I've lived in LA. I even went to college here at USC and stayed local. And um, I uh, I've always been very entrepreneurial. My 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 father. Um, was also the same way, very entrepreneurial. And I think, I don't know if it's learned or in the, in the genes or combination, but he never really had an official job. He never really worked for anyone. He, he, he used to work for his father, like working together in the factory, manufacturing um, mainly jackets in the 60s. So my dad's around 77 years old and he worked with his father. And then he went out and started his own law practice, never worked with a, an, another attorney, but got you know past the bar and And some of his early clients were people in the apparel business. And he did that for over 40 years and grew to be one of the largest um, law firms in the San Fernando Valley with around 80 attorneys. And but he I don't think he ever was that happy, like practicing law. And um, he always told me that he's probably made more money in his real estate investments over these years than practicing law. And I never had any interest in practicing law because, A, it's generally you're paid by the hour and there's a limited amount of hours. B, I had no interest in, in, in practicing law. And. In general, I, I try to avoid any litigation and whatnot and try to, if there is any, just settle and uh, the, only the lawyers make money in, in, in general in those circumstances. But um, yeah, so I, I think uh, I, I was, I just wanted to start my own business. And I started, you know, at a young age, like entrepreneurial little ventures. Like when I was 10 years old, my, um, my housekeeper slash nanny would take me to, the, to Costco. We'd buy boxes of candy bars, call it wholesale, and then sell them retail at the park one by one. And then when I was, um, call it 15, my, uh, my dad had an apparel client that was sitting on a hundred of these leather jackets. I remember them like it was yesterday. They were Perry Ellis lambskin leather jackets that retailed for like $400 at the department stores. And, and he was just couldn't sell them because they, were, they had all these small blemishes. They're called IRs, the regulars. So uh, I learned an important skill about negotiation and not being fearful to just say what I want to buy the thing for. And it, you know, if it offends the guy, okay, so be it. But so I negotiated and I, I literally bought these things for like $10 a piece and he had them sitting there for like years, couldn't sell them. And then I sold them all to uh, the parents of the students, the, the, uh, the, my teachers, the uh, janitors, whoever I could like, I had a car of leather jackets and I sold them for like 80 to hundred dollars a piece as like a, when I got my license, like 16 years old. So it was, it was pretty cool. It started making money and learning and, you know, important lessons of making money on the buy, you know, having a margin built in. And I mean, that was a huge margin, but um and then that led to my first real business, which was uh, Keats Bargain Center. We, we started um, buying and selling just all kinds of general merchandise on and then on eBay um, of all places. This was 2003 to 2007. eBay was just pretty much getting started and I didn't have so much competition. And uh, we scaled a business to where we, we sold around 200,000 items um, while I was in college. I had a, uh, a warehouse in the San Fernando Valley close to my parents' house. And I was driving back and forth from school to, to, to the warehouse and and the um, the lady that took care of me and, and my daddy and slash housekeeper like was the one that managed the staff. We had like 13 people and uh, she, while I was in school and it, it was pretty cool to uh, 
go to downtown LA to buy stuff from jobbers and go to local auctions. And eventually I made trips to China to buy like bulk, you know, containers of merchandise. So um, really cool, like at an early age running a business and learning how to deal with customers and suppliers and, and uh, employees and ultimately made some money on it and uh, just sort of got burnt out. And eventually eBay fees kept piling on and PayPal fees kept piling on and um, a lot of co competition. And eventually I just sort of um, sold out of all the remaining merchandise, donated what I couldn't sell and, and try to figure out the next thing, which, you know, happened to be real estate. Um, I could go into the story of how, how I fell into real estate, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, my cousin, Damien Langeri and I, we're always looking to start some kind of business together. We had a few start and didn't really fail, but we never really, we just ideated on different ideas and concepts. And he said his dad was buying and renovating and being very hands-on with small four to 15, 20 unit apartment communities in a, in a city called Bakersfield in the central Valley of California, which is two hours north of Los Angeles. And I said, where in God's name is Bakersfield? And he said, well, let me come here. Let me, let, let me show you. So we drove out to Bakersfield two hours, you know, and I'm like, where are we? And, and we got the freeway and it's, it's a, it's a, a, a town of around, I think 500,000. Um, and it's based on mainly oil and agriculture, which is uh, very different from here in LA, but I liked what I saw and, and, and we delved in like, you know, we had, we didn't have much money and experience, but we, Damien got an FHA loan on his first property and, uh, got a credit card advance to do the rehab, borrowed money from a friend for the down payment and, and literally, you know, just scrapes, scrape some nickels together to do, do that one. And then we bought another one where I brought the, you know, the 25% down payment. And, um, and these were back then like $150,000 purchases. They previously sold, you know, in 06 at the height, last height for like four to 500,000. So sort of no brainer kind of things, but people were very fearful and scared and there was tons of foreclosures and, that's like usually, you know, the best time to get started, but um, rents were still de declining, but, and there was still more blood to be had, but it was like, just no brainer. We, our mortgage payment was like $600 a month and our each unit rented for 695. So it was just sort of like a no brainer. And yeah, we, we learned the business by, by doing, we were driving out to Bakersfield every week, multiple times a week, back and forth and overseeing the renovation which his dad was very hands-on showing us how to deal with contractors and renovate the units. And we were, you know, signing all the checks and paying all the vendors and overseeing all the work and leasing them out. And, and that's where we cut our teeth. Like, you know, we, we read books, which is up to a certain point good. And then, but the best way of learning is by doing right. And we surrounded ourselves with great mentors, you know, and that, that's the path we took. I mean, people always ask like, you know, what's the best ideal path. It's just depends what your goals are and how your personality is. I'm just not, I'm not easily employable. I don't think I've never, I, I literally worked till lunchtime and I, and I quit at lunchtime at, at a big developer shop. I just didn't want to, you know, just file papers. I, I I'd rather file my own papers than file papers for someone else. So. Man, you are the, uh, you're, you're the entrepreneur's entrepreneur and you know, it's like, it's almost built into your DNA. And so it's really cool to hear about your story and you know, what you were doing in college and then your cousin, Damien, then kind of bringing you along to this real estate deal. So it's really interesting to think about that. Did you actually know anything about real estate or were there any, were you having any sort of thoughts about moving in this direction prior? I'm just curious. Yeah. So great question. So I graduated college in 07 and I didn't know what kind of business I was going to do. I always said I wanted to start some kind of business. And so I used that time to learn and read as much as I could about real estate any, any of my dad's meetings that included any of his real estate investments, because he wasn't the general partner. He just invested with some other people and stuff. So I would go to all those meetings. And then I spent that year uh, learning and got my broker's license. So I've only used it like once, but I uh, thought it would be good just to learn the, the nuts and bolts and like some of the, you know, the laws and, and, and um, more, just learn as much as I could about, about real estate and transactions. And so I got my broker's license and at the same time, yeah, we were trying to figure out different businesses and, and Damien's like, yes, yeah, this is what we're doing. This is the opportunity. Like, this is what the numbers look like. And I, I was intrigued, but, you know, I, I knew my parents, you know, did well in real estate investments with, with other people and stuff. And, you know, they always touted all the, you know, tax benefits of it and all the, you know, long-term compounding and benefits and the illiquid nature actually helps you stay in the game and hold these things long-term. And it's generational wealth you're creating and you can pass it down and there's step up in tax bases. There's all these beautiful things about it that, we uh, that the laws are out there and we take advantage of it and, you know, just help, help other 
we've helped, you know, 1300, 1300 other individuals and families that have invested with us, you know, we're sort of like an outsourced arm for, for individuals and families that want exposure to real estate. Most people, you know, they own their own home, maybe they own a vacation place, but they don't have any income producing properties in their portfolio. It's just, you know, the, the, they're just not exposed to it. They don't know where to start. It, it is a big dollar amount generally. So this way they can put a little in a lot of deals and not have to handle anything. And we handle everything from start to finish with the transaction. You know, it's interesting, you know, fast forwarding 15 years now from then, you know, there's some similar dynamics going on. Of course, there's some differences, but you know, you bought at a time where there was a lot of perhaps maybe a meltdown to it to a large degree. And it was, it was well underway. And I'm sure you were looking around and I'm sure it was, you know, a little bit scary to, to make that move when you were seeing declining rents, declining values, but you were also moving confidently in that future. I mean, what was it that compelled you to still move confidently when you started, you were hearing all this negativity and you were seeing people lose their shirt left and right? Yeah. I mean, we didn't have any legacy properties in portfolio to, to worry about going. So we started with a clean slate, like, you know, we started December of 08, we bought the first building. And then all of 09, we were buying these little fourplexes. And then in December of 09, we bought our first kind of larger community. Um, I'd say some of it's naivete. Some of it's just not listening to the crowd. Um, we're, we've always been very contrarian over the years. Um, like, even my mentor, like, he missed, he didn't, these, you know, 09 was a generational buying opportunity. You know, 09, 10, 11, 12, he just for years was just like not buying stuff, just, you know, things are going to get worse, whatever. Like you can't time the exact bottom or the ex exact top. And so it's, it's, it's like, you know, we're buying throughout cycles, but like, it's like when the market starts heating up, heating up, heating up, we just sl slowly lift the get the foot off the accelerator a little bit. Right. So we're slowing down. And, and then, and then when things start really, you know, struggling and shit hits the fan and stuff and there's this place, you know, negativity. And then we start stepping down harder and, 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 and there's periods of time, like we're entering one right now, right? Like we didn't buy a deal for a year and we were patient. And I mean, I, I'm actually impatient, um, but we were forced to be patient because we kept getting outbid on things or the sellers kept pulling things. And we just didn't feel comfortable buying a certain price. And now like pricing is reset. Values are down 20 to 40% depending on what it is and where it is. And sure, could it go down more? Okay. Could, could fundamentals erode more? Sure. But I think it's, it's like all priced in, in my opinion, and we're long-term hold anyway. And with conservative leverage and like, yeah, I think now is a great buying opportunity. Uh, is it as bad as it was in 09? No, but where value destruction was even worse then, but like the fundamentals then were even, were way worse. Rents dropped tremendously there, like from peak to trough in, in Phoenix, our first major market, we bought 2,500 units from 2010 to 15. Rents dropped 20%. Values drop like in half. And today you're you're starting to see fundamentals erode, like where rents are declining in those markets, the boom and bust markets. The other markets are slowing down a lot, the growth. Um, but values are way off. So we're, I, I think it's a great time to start deploying capital. And that's what we just started doing. I and mean, we're buying a deal right now in Southern California and a core location, newer building. And I think finally sellers are realizing we're not, you know, 15 months ago pricing, you know. So, uh, you know, there's some sellers out there that are starting to, capitulate and sell stuff. So yeah, I've heard you say all roads come back to buy and hold. And I think it, you know, this is a great time to come back to that realization that this is a long game. You know, I think there's been a lot of players who are, you know, looking for the quick money. And over the past few years, there's been a lot of that irrational exuberance, which has driven, you know, players like yourselves being outbid to so many, you know, such a large degree. And, and um, you know, that patience is now paying off. Of course, I'm sure you guys are seeing some pretty compelling opportunities, all things considered. But going back to those early days, I'm curious. I mean, you were talking about driving back and forth to Bakersfield and, and managing this asset and, you know, working through that whole thing and really getting your hands dirty. Talk to me about where you took things from there, because I'm, I'm sure that was hard. I know when I got started, I was doing self-management as well. And that was a big, big challenge. But talk to me about where um, things went from there. Yeah. So one of the hardest things is going from zero to one, right? Like in terms of starting a business, having your first kid zero to one is, is a shock to the system. I'd say that, that was difficult. Like we didn't know how to get started, where to go, like just everything's new. Right. But we got started and the momentum started picking up and stuff. And, um, we, we made a big evolution going from the four plexes to the blind, the 78 unit. And we realized we needed, we had big gaps, right? One, 
capital, obviously. So I'm like, how do we, how do we raise? So we went from raising like hundred grand per deal for these little fourplexes to raising 1.3 million for the first deal we bought. Uh, um, so we put together a group of eight people and the ringleader, we brought in my dad who has a great track record as an attorney and people really like him and good reputation as a businessman. So we brought in like family friends and clients of his that were the original eight investors that put up 1.3 million in this deal that we bought in Bakersfield for 3.9 million. And then the next year we bought another bigger deal in Bakersfield, 128 units. And then we moved into Phoenix with our first big deals, 415 units in Phoenix, which today would be over hundred million that back then it was 16 million. And we raised five and a half million, which was a, the next big jump from going from one to 2 million to five and a half million. And it, it took us six months post close to continue raising the money. And like we had, we borrowed money from lines of credit and from friends to help close the deal. And looking back, that was like one of the best deals and the best times to, to, to be buying. But um, we've always kept pushing the envelope and going into new markets when people are exiting the markets, like the, the institutions generally, their timing has been sort of screwy. Like they, they were exiting Phoenix when we were entering it and they're, <laughs> they're exiting SoCal now when we're, we're going more aggressive. And like, so <laughs> timing wise, that, that's the good counter indicator. Also when it's like, people are more fearful and it's harder to raise money. That's generally a good indicator that the deals are going to do well. Um, but yeah, we, we, we were buying in Phoenix 2010, 11, 12, like no one was there. It wasn't a hot market and we sold everything in 2017, probably two, three years early in this, in that big cycle. But I always said to myself, I'd rather be early than late uh, and having to go through another cycle. And it helped create the track record. We returned capital to investors, helped create a track record, put some money into our pockets. So we, we had some resources and, and we're able to, you know, keep doing what we're doing and hold long term and whatnot. And um, that's how we grew in the early days, you know, Bakersfield to Phoenix. And then we moved into new markets for different reasons. You know, Salt Lake City, no one wanted to go there eight years ago. It was a small market and why Salt Lake it was slow and steady. But we saw like, you know, just so much dynam dynamicism and, and young population and growth and just like geographic barriers to entry and lack of some new supply and like, so, and everything worked out. I mean, Salt Lake's been one of our biggest, best performing markets. Denver, we came in after, it was already growing pretty good for a few years, maybe six, seven, eight years ago. And and people were like, oh, it's a little too late and whatnot. And we crushed it in Denver. Um, Albuquerque, we bought, um, no one, that was the hardest raise, Albuquerque. You know, Breaking Bad was on, people were like, this, this is Albuquerque. But literally no, it's, tough to build new units there. There was no, nothing in the supply pipeline and rents were very affordable. So like it just took off the rents after, after a few years of holding it and cap rates just dropped. I mean, values skyrocketed and we, we uh, sold the, the sizzle and, and got out of there. You know, we bought it for 50 million, sold it for like 150 million. And, you know, it just said, thank you, Albuquerque. And, and, and maybe we'll be back there one day. I'm, I'm, I'm as a professional investor, like I, I don't fall in love with anything. And I mean, I, I, I fall in love with just like, Try to with the long term compounding. If we sell something, we always try to roll it with the 1031 exchange, but we won't force it. If like something's not available, like we, we won't force force the issue. Um, I one of my mentors says he'd rather regret uh, buying a property. Oh, sorry, he would rather regret not buying a property than buying a property he would later regret. So I, I've taken that to heart and I, I totally understand that one. Um, and he always said time and inflation are real estate's best friends, which we've, we've seen, you know, time and time again. And like, yeah, like when I started, I'm like, oh, I wish I was alive earlier to be buying in the early 90s when they and then 09 hit. And then looking back, that looks so cheap. And then I'm sure right now when things are off 20 to 40 percent, you know, 10, 15 years from now, it's going to be like, wow, I wish I was buying more in you know, 2023 or whatever. So Right. And, you know, having the foresight to see or, you know, the vision to see what others are not seeing is something that I'm observing with you because hindsight is 2020. Like you can look back and say, well, of course we should have entered Denver or Salt Lake City and all these different markets that, you know, at the time people were looking at you like, are you crazy? And, you know, now it's like, totally clear, but I'm curious about, you know, talk to me a little bit about that confidence and willingness to act when, you know, the market or, you know, the talking points across the board are saying the opposite of the actions that you're taking. I mean, tell me a little bit about the vision that you've been able to step into. Is it just really studying history and, you know, following sort of the thought process of when others are fearful, be greedy. And, and when others are greedy, be fearful. Or what else would you say about that? Bakersfield, like people in LA, like, they don't know where Bakersfield is. Why Bakersfield? Like I had it. We literally took hundred plus trips to Bakersfield 
loading up the car, bringing people like loading up a sprinter van, just bring our investors out there to show them the lay of the land and why Bakersfield and like, you know, what we're doing out there. And in Phoenix, we literally, you know, we didn't have much money, but we would take our axe team and roll that into flying. We, we would charter like planes of nine people and bring our biggest investors out there to see the properties and see the lay of the land. And, and like, that was just so important to show them what our vision was, show them Phoenix is the fifth largest city in the United States or was back then. I don't know what I haven't tracked in a few years, but like it's a huge city. It's going to, it's going to recover at some point. And I mean, it just like, yeah, it, it things change. It was temporarily hit, but it, it's, it's bounced back. So, so, you know, right now it's hard to raise money in Southern California. And there's a lot of people that are anti-California and they, because they read the headlines and yeah, there is some truth in that, but it's, it's all priced in, in my opinion. Right. Like, it's it's all priced in and we're buying great value and it's high barrier to entry market and i think five to ten years we're gonna look back and be like thank god we bought all these great newer vintage assets in southern california and you know we're competing against also you know the risk-free rate the, the u.s treasuries and money markets paying four to five and a half percent or whatever and you know but i think that's short term and, and that's not going to be forever so like you know yeah generating three four five percent with upside and like where we're going to hopefully hit our 12 to 15 we always project we, we underwrite try to find a 12 to 15 irr kind of thing and you know we've averaged like 22 to 25 like oh, to try to under promise over deliver kind of thing but yeah those three to five percent thing is good now but it's 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 not as tax efficient because of with the real estate we have depreciation to shelter all that and and also i think those are going to be short term i don't think you're, you're here in a high rate environment indefinitely i think you know it's and you're already seeing long-term rates are coming down and so I think uh, I think those are good for short term, just to park money that until you find something. But it's definitely yeah, it's not an easy time to raise capital, and that those are the best times. I, I just believe in my gut that these are going to be great deals that we're buying right now, and just like I thought, you know, 2010 to 15, and it was tough to raise, but it, enough a lot of no's, but there's a few people out there that are yeses, and you just gotta you know find them. And they have to buy into the vision and you align yourselves with the right investors, which we have, right? Just people that are long-term minded and patient. And if someone's into, they need the liquidity in a year or two, I'm like, it's not, we're not the right people, right? Because we're long-term. If, if they want to, you know, hit a, a 10 X return, you know, yeah, you'll be 10 X, but it'll, it'll probably take 15, 20 years. That's, but it like, it's going to happen, but over a long period of time, it, it, 10 X, you got to, take way too much risk by, you know, startups and st like, which is fine for a small piece of your portfolio, maybe. Right. But not the big money should go into the safest things, in my opinion, you know, real estate and, you know, maybe buying uh, blue chip indexes of stocks and just, so that, that's the way I, I view it. Yeah. It's interesting because when I'm listening to you and I ask you the question of how do you, how, how have you gained the confidence and willingness to act when others are saying the opposite? It almost feels like it's just become common sense for you because you're so deeply entrenched in this game and in the market, in psychology and in trends and where you're, you're, you see the future before it develops. It almost feels like to a large degree. So I am, I'm curious about how you've developed that. I mean, what that has been other than just repetition and, you know, surrounding yourself with others, you know, who are perhaps ahead of you or in other aspects. And in addition to that, I would like to know, and this is a little bit separate, you know, when you think about long term and bringing other investors along the, the ride with you, I'm curious what the structure for these long term investments generally looks like for you, because, you know, in, in, in a large degree in the capital raising world, people are looking at, you know, a five year time horizon, which is not necessarily long term. So I know a couple of separate questions there. Elevate Nation, you know, you can't manage what you don't measure. So when it comes to marketing and sales, how can you be sure your decisions are the right ones? I've got the answer for you, Sharp Wilkinson. Sharp Wilkinson is a unique agency that specializes in developing data-driven marketing and sales strategies for clients. I've been working with Sharp Wilkinson for a while now, and I can personally attest to the way that they immerse themselves in my organization and maintain a hyper-responsive orientation. Best of all, they use data to inform their strategies and drive real tangible growth. And every company needs continuing growth, right? If you think your organization could benefit from data-driven marketing and sales, growth starts at Sharp Wilkinson. Visit sharpwilkinson.com to take the first step on your journey. Tell them Tyler sent you. Yeah, we always show seven to 10 year hold projections. And the reason I do that is like, yeah, to train the investors that this is long term hold. That being said, our average hold has been like five, six years. And um, like, uh, and we sold some as little as one or two years even. But like, I, I just like the long term hold mindset. I like the compounding mindset. And, and this, and when we sell, we always try to 1031 exchange, which 
prolongs the, you know, having to pay the tax man, which allows the money to compound without any money's taken out of it, which is going to be huge over, over long periods of time. So um, the investors ha ha have the option not to roll with us. Uh, maybe five to 10% don't roll when we sell an exchange. Um, most want to keep the monies going and not, you know, and then, you know, over time, eventually we refi and cash out refi and distribute that money. And that's all tax deferred money too, to the investors. Um, so the ultimate goal, the long game is to get all the money out and still own the building. It takes a long time to do that, but um, we, we've successfully done that. We just did it on a deal in Salt Lake. We've owned eight years where we returned all the capital and then some, and it's been cash flowing like crazy. And we still own the buildings, a slot machine that per perpetually pays. Like one of my mentors was telling me about a building he bought, you know, maybe it was 20, 30 years ago for 3 million bucks. And every year now it returns 3 million bucks. He got his original, maybe put, let's say 25% down or even a third a million down, like he's gotten that back multiples, you know, over, over the time. It's just the law of compounding and, you know, utilizing, you know, real estate as, and letting the tenants pay down the mortgage and time and inflation and rents growing over time. And you can't have any wipeouts in real estate. In uh, VC, you're going to have 20, 30, 40 portfolio companies and you're expecting, you want to have some donuts because that means you took the risk, like, you know, thought of some, this company maybe could be life-changing and visionary and it's going to make a hundred X, thousand X, like you need those big but in real estate, the, the return the return profile is even more narrow. You're, if if you shoot for too high of return, like if you take on the max leverage, yeah, your your rate of return could be higher, but it's not going to make it multiples higher, right? So might as well not max out the leverage. Just we always stress test the deal, you know, like what could occupancy drop to, and so it's still positively cash flowing. What what could rents drop to, and and have a big margin of error, and even then some we raise extra capital up front for rainy days, rainy day reserves, right? So we don't have to, we've never had a, a capital call. We've never lost a dollar principal. Um, and, you know, I want to try to keep it that way. You know? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it, it, when I go to your, you know, your Twitter profile, it says compounding. That's the only thing it says in, in the, uh, in the description there or in your bio. And I love that. And you also put a tweet out that said, remember that compounding results are seen in decade intervals but you have to put in the baby steps daily in that direction. So talk to me a little bit about what you mean by that, because, you know, in many aspects, what we're talking about in, in terms of compounding, it's, it's a simple concept yet hard in reality for, for most people, because most people aren't willing to commit to that daily step every single day. So talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah. I mean, it, it took me probably a decade to really understand that and see that and see the, understand the power of compounding. I think the, if you could get that and really understand it, the earlier you are in life, like the better, because it's not just money, it's relationships, right? It's like the compounding, your reputation compounds and compounding could go the other way too. Right. So I'd say, you know, and I get frustrated on some days, but I'm like, if I can make just little baby steps of towards, you know, of, of good, toward, you know, over a long period of time, it, it really, and now we have, we've been in this since, you know, 13 years ish. And like, you know, the first five years were, you know, the f first year or two was really tough. And I was still living at home. I couldn't make any enough money to leave the house. I was living, you know, 23, 24, living at home. I didn't, I, I didn't want to pay as, as a guy, landlord. I don't want to pay any rent, right? I'm living That's at home that until I make enough money to have the money for a down payment. And, um, and then the first five years were this. And then the next five years were this. And then we're into our third five years. It's going to be like this. It's, it's really, truly a compounding kind of business and mindset and it's just you got to do baby steps every day and and um it's it's not like if you yeah we're not gonna see like a huge jump year to years it's, it's like you got to play the long game and and commit to something and uh make your life work sort of like we are in real estate where I'm, i could be doing real estate my whole life you know it's, it's not like a like a professional athlete you have a, a limited amount of time to do your 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 sport right that's the way I view it. Like just, and, and you see, and you see it really in the wealthiest families, like they're multi-generational real estate families because they've been buying their whole life. And like, you know, I'm going to do pretty well, but my kids are going to be even better off and like, and, and just hopefully keep them staying hungry and humble. That's the biggest, you know, concern with, with that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, we, we involve our kids. Like we bring them to the job sites, show them what we're doing. I mean, they're all, they're three, four and seven. So it has to be age appropriate, but, uh, get them thinking about, you know, we drive around town and, oh, th that building looks, you know, it's run down and it needs to be renovated. Okay. What, what color would you paint it? Like what, <laughs> what, what, you know, it look, it's, it's near these cool new restaurants like that are popping up, like just get them thinking a little bit and, and 
you know, hopefully start them, you know, really low and, and maybe support them and if they want to do their own thing too. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm just a believer in the, the long-term power of compounding. I mean, in, any investment in, in any relationship um, it's, it's, it brings fruit, you know, it, and most people, I mean, I'm impatient, but I, I, I think of it. I try to be every day, remind myself to be long-term. One of my investors says you're, you're very long-term greedy. You, you, you work, I'm, because I always say if, if the investor does well, like I'm going to do well, I'm not going to get rich off one deal, but if over a long period of time, you're investing with us, then you tell your friends and your family. And I'm, we have a lot of investors we're dealing with their second generation now. And like, you know, it's, um, it's, it's all, life is all about the best. Real, I've read something with, you know, Naval Ravikant's a really smart, sharp guy. And I read a lot of, someone put a book together of all his, his tweets. And a lot of it has to do with like, just the, the power of, of long-term compounding, you know, and, and uh, it's pretty powerful. I, mean, I really didn't understand it until like I, I, I sat down and thought like in terms of numbers, I sat with a calculator and, and started compounding at different rates and seeing what, what it would do. And the longer the time you have, and obviously the higher rate of compounding, like it, it creates crazy. I mean, it's crazy. I mean, there's charts like Warren Buffett. Most of his wealth was created after like 50 or 60, right? You know, it's, 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 it's wild. It simplifies things. And it also tells people to trust the process, stick with it. When it feel, when you feel like giving up, keep going. And, you know, I'm kind of like you where I'm patiently impatient so to speak, where it's like my activity. And I think actually Naval Ravikant said this patience with results, but impatience with actions. And when you think about that, it's like, oh, that makes a lot of sense. So you've got to show up daily. You've got to continue to press forward. You've got to be persistent. You've got to keep learning. But over time, that's where it compounds. And, um, you know, the other thing you were talking about your kids, I, I, we have 18 month old twins and they love this book called Good Night, Good Night Construction Site. And my son, he makes the sound of the trucks and everything. And I'm thinking, oh man, they're interested in the construction site. I mean, this is so exciting because now this is like the seeds of generational prosperity that we can sort of get them excited about these things. And of course, if they're not, you know, it is what it is. But um, I, I just think about that. It's really, really exciting. But now, now looking back 15 years, you know, from really starting your journey, I mean, what advice would you give your younger self other than obviously trust the process and lean into the compounding nature of relationships and, you know, showing up and doing the hard things? What other advice would you give your younger self about scaling in real estate and, and continuing to build the right way? Some of our biggest misses were like, you know, when we, when we were we, the shiny object syndrome, like, you know, the grass is greener syndrome, I'd say like we, uh, we didn't focus, you know, I, I was looking at you know, is this gal going to transform into more of a, all kind of investments. So we started doing VC stuff, which it just didn't move the needle on paper. They've done well, but it just, first of all, it's on paper. We haven't seen any real meaningful exits yet, but it's, it's, so it's still a lot unknown and it's, it's, it was just distractions, right? So the compounding way is to really keep focused. And um, I'd say with the mobile home parks we were buying, we did well, but like we didn't stick to our, like we saw a big portfolio in Pennsylvania that was, uh, you know, it, it was a good size and it would bring us mass, but literally the population of the city was declining and stuff. And like, you know, we thought, and we just couldn't push rents. And at the end of the day, we, we, we made like an eight IRR, we projected a 12 or whatever. So it was, it was a miss. We've only missed two or three times. So the, the one, the times we've missed are, I'd say the, uh, on the mobile home parks there where we thought, you know, getting mass and size and just getting in would, you know, but it, it just, didn't work out that way. And then uh, one property that just had a lot more deferred maintenance and a lot of this, that's why we're, we're buying a lot of newer properties. Some of these old properties are just sucking capital like crazy. Um, and another one uh, during COVID, just collections were, were just abysmal. And um, it was a market that was just like, yeah, really, really rough to deal with. And on top of it, it was an older building and stuff. So those were the, call it eight to seven to 10, I think IRR, like, which, which were still solid singles, but not, as good as we projected. So we, we always try to under promise over deliver and that those, I felt bad. We didn't, but um, yeah, look, look if, if we just never lose any money and have a good track record, like that's, that would be a win. Cause this is money. That's like, you don't want to take the risk on kind of real, the real estate money is like a low risk kind of thing. In my opinion, you shouldn't, you know, t t take a huge amount of risk. It doesn't sound like you regret any of those decisions, but there were learnings that you're sharing, right? Yeah. All learnings. And then like partnerships, like we had, a, we had some great, partners that are no longer with us and we learned a lot from them but i think having like-minded partners and and is like 
the most important if, if you have partner. Some people do, are, are better without partners. So knowing if you're going to be a better business with partners or without partners, right? There's pros and cons, but I bounce ideas all the time off my partners. I'm, you know, very aggressive. They're very conservative. Like it just hel it helps to balance it out and, and, and have more minds at the table as well. So um, we used to have five of us. Now there's only three of us. And, and it's like, it, it, it evolves. Would I, would I change anything? Like, I mean, may, maybe, you know, certain investors, like maybe not take their money if, if, if knowing that, but I didn't know there were going to be, there were going to be pains in the butts and berate, <laughs> ber berate my staff. And like, you know, just like, I, I could, I could take a little bit of that stuff, but I don't, I don't want, you know, that, that happening to my staff and stuff. So I agree with that. Tell me about yeah. this quote. Uh, I love this one too. Success is built on delusional optimism, paranoia, and an inability to quit. Tell me a little bit about what the thinking behind that quote is. I mean, so I think it's something you tweeted a while back as well. Yeah. I think that was sort of an idea my, my cousin and co-founder Damien had. And I think, look, you're having optimism, you know, and realism, like being a pessimist, it just, it does not know nothing good being optimist and realist and have persistence and like grit. That, that's, the, that's what differentiates people in life. And like, just looking back, I mean, that's what has enabled me to get to where I am, like having the grit to start the business. And even I, like, I give the story about like my wife, I, I literally um, met her in like March of 09 and I was just consistent and persist persistent and I didn't get a first date until like August or like end of the year or something. Like it, it was just like, I just kept that. I knew what I wanted. I liked what I saw. Like I was just very persistent. And, and now, you know, we're married 11 years with three kids later, but like just every, anything in life is worth going after. That's, that's good. Like I could have just dropped that with my wife and gone on the apps that were just forming and that's why the apps are, are good for or getting in front of people, but it's bad for like the dating apps. You could just, okay. If, if someone, you know, isn't easy to put out or whatever, like just go to the next one. Boom, 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 boom. Like it's hard. It's, it's it doesn't teach persistence and perseverance. It's in my opinion, it's the opposite, but, um, sounds like you yeah. wore her down, man. I wore her down for sure, man. I mean, <laughs> uh, I, I wear, I wear, I wear people down with kindness though. I'm not, I'm, I wasn't like, I wasn't, uh, you know, like, uh, I just wore her down with kindness and, um, yeah. No, I, I agree. And, uh, well, first of all, you've been super kind with us in this conversation. So I just want to thank you real quickly, but you know, the, the one piece of that, and I totally agree with this entire quote, but one of the things that we don't really talk a lot about on this podcast is the paranoia piece. And it's been something that's actually been top of mind for the past couple of years or so for me, just in protect in particular, I feel like there is a healthy amount of paranoia that you can, you know, utilize. And I think it can get to an unhealthy place, but what is the difference for you? I mean, do you, does that resonate with you? Does it make sense? Yeah. yeah. I mean, we're the most paranoia and par like we're paranoid to like lo lose any monies. Right. Like I, I can't sleep at night knowing like we, we've, so like that's yeah, the biggest too. fear. That's the biggest fear. And we, on, on one of our fourplexes, we lost like 30 grand of an investor and we, we came out of pocket, which was, this was when we had no money, really. We came out of pocket to make them whole so we could keep a track record of having never lost money for, for, for investors. And um, I'd say the, the, that's the most paranoia and just like, I mean, in business, you take risk, but I think we, we try to mitigate the risk as much as we can. And um, yeah, we're, I mean, we're, we're, you know, it's a healthy amount of paranoia. You're not, you're not, we're not, not, not if you're so paranoid, you're not going to come out of your house, right? Like you're just, gonna, it's got to push you to action in other words, right? Yeah. I think push you to action. Um, and, uh, be more strategic, be smarter. It. Yeah, exactly. So, so a healthy amount of it, I think, but not, not just, so I'd love to, now that we've really established this, you know, thought process of how you think, and we're really, you know, diving into the ways that your mind is sort of interacting with the opportunities of today. I'm curious, what does the next decade hold? And what, what's your outlook on the next decade? Because we're talking about, you know, compounding that is, you know, those results are seen over a decade. I'm curious from where we stand today, what do you see over the next 10 years? Yeah, I think um, continuing to buy you know, apartments. Um, I have an awesome guy leading our self storage platform, just continuing to grow in, in those areas and, you know, just not lose any monies from the investors. 
per constant, consistently provide those singles and doubles. And if the market gives us a triple or home run, great. Um, I'd say, yeah, I mean, Geltz is going to continue doing what we're doing, surviving through these tough periods. I mean, yeah, collections were shitty during COVID, but we were able to go ride through them. Um, you know, we, we have a few of these floating rate loans that are causing some grief, but we're going to get through them. You know, we just mitigated our risk. We didn't, we, 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 we didn't do the whole portfolio floating rate. Like a lot of our peers did, and you know, like, you know, and, and yeah, it was, it's, it's always like when the values have gone up, it was, it was tempting to just sell everything. Right. And like, but then we would have no business and I would have no long term and the 10, 20 years from now, these, those are going to look silly that we sold those things. And, and if we didn't exchange and whatnot. So like, I'd say, yeah, 10, next 10 years, just continuing to grow the platform, grow the investor base, um, grow the portfolio and try to zig when others zag. Right. Like, you know, I think it's some, my wife sort of spearheads all the ground up development and uh, at times that's better than, than, than other times. So we'll, we'll probably have more or less projects depending on the time of development, different times, more or less on the buying right now. We're, yeah, we're in the process of starting our first um, fund. We've never done a, a fund where we're going to launch uh, most likely a $250 million investment vehicle and try to r raise capital from different kinds of sources. And it'll give us more, firepower to having committed capital just going versus going deal by deal um which will allow us to really buy larger properties and more more importantly like portfolios we've never been able to you know we, we could raise a good amount of money at a clip for one property but usually all the engines stop and we have to raise for that property and so if another one comes or another one comes or a big portfolio comes like we're just you know strung hamstrung by by, by the capital raising so excited about that um what else um man excited about what opportunities are starting to occur right now and um that are that are uh, going to keep occurring for the un un you know next few years probably yeah so tell me about that i mean in terms of outlook um i'm actually curious specifically what do you anticipate will change and what do you anticipate will stay the same that investors should be paying attention to here over the next, you know, it's probably very difficult to answer that question over a 10 year time horizon, but maybe over the next three to five years. My mentor always says to his investors and I say to like in the next one, two, three years, the property, the value could, could be, could be down, maybe will be down. Let's say it's down in the next like seven to 10 years that, you know, that building is going to be way more valuable. Cash flows going to be a lot higher. Um, but right now we're, we're already seeing, um, I, you know, uh, inflation t being tamed, um, the economy, s s you know, slowing down, st but still strong, but it was not, not being overheated. We, you know, and, and yeah, we pumped so much money into the system and, and, and just like, it, it was bound to ha happen. I think, um, you know, the, I think with AI and different technology, you're going to have some jobs lost, but m even more jobs gained, like technology has, has always provided, you know, over the years. So I'm still very bullish on you know the demand side for apartments and self-storage office is like another a, a, a big i think that could be we we bought a a four acre oh, sorry seven acre office park but to redevelop into multifamily. so i think they make great covered land plays and you're going to see a lot of uh pain there but then you're going to see new people come in and buy at much cheaper prices and when the lenders take back or short sale or whatever and it'll re reset rents lower and it'll probably insinuate, but I don't know if it'll incite enough demand to really take, you know, all that space that, that that's there. So I think that has fundamental change, uh, shopping, like malls, you know, enclosed malls change has changed. Like things change. And I don't, I don't see any for multifamily. I don't see that changing. I think rent renter nations here to say, um, you know, it ebbs and flows the, the, the amount of people that rent versus home ownership. But I say with 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 rates so elevated and with the lack of you know supply in certain markets, um, short term I'm 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 optimistic, but long term I'm really bullish. Yeah. yeah, I'm hard pressed to find those unforeseen risks in the multifamily space as well. I mean, you, you're talking about office, and you know you would think back ten years ago. I would think that most office investors would have been hard pressed to have foreseen the pandemic and the work from home revolution. That's really just absolutely been catastrophic for the office landscape. I mean, are there anything, is there anything that's remotely on the horizon that you anticipate as a tremendous risk on the multifamily side or the self-storage side and so forth? I mean, anything that's really kind of on the periphery there? Yeah, I mean, so the office side, like, yeah, we, we always had the ability for many years to work remotely, but 
I think COVID just was like an accelerator. And mm-hmm. I think it'll, it, it, people are still slowly trickling into the offers. I mean, I, I could use our scenario, like for Gelt, it's a, it's a, we had, um, we have 30 people and everyone was in the office until COVID and then COVID hit. Everyone's out of the office. Everyone's remote for a few years, a year, uh, last October, we got a satellite office, a smaller footprint where we made it optional. And now we're doing like a few days on a few days off for people. So like slowly people are coming back, but we're in a much smaller space than we were. So I think your people are going to come more and more back, but it's not going to be to the level where it was in my, in my opinion. Um, so I think the demand's down um, tremendously, but then yeah, you're not going to see new supply probably for a long time. So the pe- you know the people that are buying at what what's the right price to pay? It's uh, but that's where the opportunity is when no one really knows right what what the right price is for something. So, uh, but I, I still re- re- would rather have the tailwinds and 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 that fight the headwinds. So like that's why you know I, I like apartments still. Um, and uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're zigging and zagging, you know, we're going about the last three years more in so- SoCal selling out of the Phoenix and, you know, the boom and bust markets, but we'll, we'll, we'll be back there. I'm sure when, when, you know, because there's a lot of buys out there over the last couple of years with very high leverage with floating rate debt. And if rates stay elevated, I mean, it's, it's, um, I know it's already causing a lot of pain for people. So I just don't know when you're going to start seeing, you know, l- lenders taking it, in, you know, in the shorts or, or taking over properties or, or, you know, how, how much they're going to work with the borrowers. I, I just don't know, but I, I see signs of stress already and, and, and values are down because rates have shot up so much. Right. So. Absolutely. Keith, you've been super generous with your time and your wisdom today. So I just want to thank you so much. And before I let you go, I want to transition to the rapid fire section of the podcast. It's called the rare air questionnaire. It's all about being uncommon and being willing to lean into the compounding nature of time, inflation and persistency, consistency and all the beautiful things that we've talked about today. So uh, before I let you go, I want to ask you a few questions. If you had to point to two or three of the most impactful books that you've read over the past few years, what would those be and why? Yeah. Um, on the real estate front, I'd say uh, Principles of Real Estate Syndication by my friend, mentor, and partner, Sam Freshman. We've done a lot of things together over the years. He's getting up there in age, around 90, and um, he's uh, sort of the pioneer of real estate syndication. So I, I always recommend that one. Um, other books. I mean, I've read, I get inspired by entrepreneurial stories. So I say Shoe Dog was an amazing read. Great I book. I really love the Phil Knight story. Um what else? Um, I mean, it's important for real estate. I, re- I read, I forget what it was called, but from cover to cover, some big, thick p- book on real estate, like financing and just got the meat and potatoes. It was like something like real estate finance. And I, I forget the name of it, but it, is it Peter uh, Lineman? It wasn't his, his, his um, I really enjoyed Sam Zell's, uh, you know, autobiography. Um, Am I being too subtle? Yeah, that was a great read. Um, yeah, I agree. Napoleon Hill, Think and Grow Rich, really brought me to the right mindset early on. Um, when I was young, I read all the Robert Kiyosaka, whatever his name is, the Rich Dad, Poor Dad stuff. Just, yep. I think understand, understanding that investment versus just getting paid by the hour kind of thing. And mm-hmm. um, so, and then, and then you got great, like, Twitter is awesome because you follow, you can follow whoever the hell you want. I, I try to follow, you know, thought leaders and people that I admire and, and just people that sort of share what they're thinking occasionally and try to make sense of it all. And, um, you know, you, you could, that, that's another cool thing. So, um, you can follow whoever you want. Right. And I've learned a lot from, from people from afar that don't even know I'm, I'm learning from them. You know, I love that. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. We will put links in the show notes as to where the listeners can find those books. I did want to mention, uh, you mentioned shoe dog as well. And there's a great new movie that just came out. It's called air. And it's about Nike securing Michael Jordan back in the day. And it reminded me of the story of Shoe Dog and just interlacing that, uh, you know, entrepreneurial story with that long shot of a, you know, a signing, which totally transformed the company for so many generations thereafter. It's just such a cool story. Yeah, it was a great film. And I didn't really know the, the history of that and, and the genesis. And I mean, yeah, it was, it was really cool. Uh, you know, I, I really liked it. And Ben Affleck was a good actor and Matt Damon and stuff. So, yeah. yeah, they did great. Uh, aside from what we've already talked about today, Keith, what is the biggest way that you elevate your life on a daily basis? It's a good question. Elevate my life. I mean, I find a lot of meaning 
in um, being a family man and being around my kids. So I, I, I spent, try to spend a lot of quality, not a lot, of, but just quality time with them, like uninterrupted, um, you know, one-on-one. -on -one. I have three kids. So do try to do as much one-on-one -on -one with them as I can different activities going if it's going to dinner a frozen yogurt like my daughter likes color me mine like just whatever brings them joy and just doing that with them and um and then date night with my wife every thursday night um going going tonight actually and spending time and and, and really you know spending a lot of time with her in, in a meaningful way uh and, it, and then getting away from the kids once in a while to recharge right like going, going on vacations with her little getaway trips on the weekends whatnot um so uh what was the question i like i'm just rambling biggest way that you elevate your life i mean it sounds like being with your family being present. family friends business my my close business partners and then yeah being being uh active on twitter just and meeting a lot of these people in real life you know yeah, I can tell why you've been so successful, man, because you're genuine and, uh, you know, you're all about giving and you know that that comes back to you, which is such a cool thing to see in real life in, in so many aspects of what you've been doing. But uh, I'd also love to know, how do you elevate? What is the biggest way that you elevate others around you? I think just um, as, a, as a leader, I'm, I'm very into giving them autonomy and um, letting in sort of like I, I'm not very micromanaging and letting them own, own their decisions. And, um, I'm very giving in that, like, you know, we, there's just unlimited upside at Gelt here for, for people that bring value, right? Like you, I always tell people you get paid for how irreplaceable you are. And I just say, find ways to make yourself irreplaceable in the organization. And, and, uh, there's different people that in the organization that, you know, have like golden handcuffs and because they're so irreplaceable. Right. So, I love that, man. I love that. Well, Keith, I just want to acknowledge you because first of all, this has been an insightful conversation, one that I know that the listeners are going to walk away with tremendous amount of value and wisdom that they can come back and revisit as they continue to compound their own journey. So I want to acknowledge you. I want to let you know how much I appreciate, uh, you know, the wisdom that you've shared with us today and for making the time to be with us today. Do you have any parting thoughts or words of wisdom that you'd like to share with Elevate Nation today? Um, Feel free to contact me. I mean, I, I, I answer as long as it's a thoughtful question or comment, like I'll, I'll answer you on, on, on LinkedIn, uh, Twitter. Uh, those are the social networks I'm active on. I just I just did the threads thing. I, so my Instagram's private because I share uh, family kind of pictures and stuff. And, and, and but I, on threads, I'm public, Twitter, public, LinkedIn, public, or they could email me Keith at geltinc.com. What was the question? Uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Parting thoughts or words of wisdom. You've been, uh, you know, if you've got more, please. Be yeah. Be look, you got to believe in yourself. You got to support others and lift others. Be your authentic self. Um, uh, you know, try to mitigate risk as much as you can and uh, learn from others' mistakes. Yeah. Where can the listeners find you other than you mentioned Twitter? We'll put uh, links in the show notes and of course, uh, you know, social media in general, but is it geltventures.com as well? Yeah, I, I still go by my old email. I think, yeah, I think it's gelt-ventures, but I, it's, I'm just Keith at geltinc.com uh, still goes directly to me. Yeah. Well, Keith Wasserman, again, thank you so much for being on the podcast. I look forward to part two, hopefully at one uh, point in the, in the future, and uh, we'll revisit this continued compounding experience that you're stepping into. So appreciate you, man. Have a great day. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me. Elevate Nation. What a powerful wise conversation with Keith Wasserman. I learned so much from this podcast today, and there's so much that you can read between the lines in terms of what he was sharing with us, not only from his story, the way that he's thinking about things today, but the deep truth that he operates within in terms of compounding, and just continuing to persist, continuing to get after it and letting time really serve as the multiplier of your results, because you've, you've just got to stay in the game. You've got to continue to persist. You've got to do the right thing. You've got to invest in relationships. You've got to invest in others. You've got to invest in yourself and you've got to trust the process. So just, I hope that you found half as much value as I did because I'm walking away with a ton of notes, a ton of opportunities to act on those notes. So I'd love to ask you to identify what are your top one, two or three key distinctions or takeaways from this podcast today? What did you really walk away saying, you know what? Wow, I hadn't thought about that. Or, you know what? I've been thinking in the opposite way. So how can I navigate back to the deep truth that Keith was sharing with me today? 
I want to encourage you also to have a discussion with someone else about what you learned today. Of course, you want to share this episode with them prior to and say, look, I want to talk to you about this, integrate some of the things that we talked about today so that we can take things to the next level and so that the next decade can be so much better than the last, even though even if the last was phenomenal. By the way, there are no mistakes in your journey and you are where you are for a reason and where your future self would like you to be is something that you can lean into in terms of dedicating yourself to the compounding interests of all of these concepts of investing in yourself, of learning, of investing in real estate and allowing your team to expand and to grow into these assets so that they can continue to expand and grow so that you can do the things that you want to do and you are, you know, you know, are a part of your future. So I want to encourage you to identify the opportunities to take action on this episode, because that's where the power really lies is in the pension to take action. So until next time, Elevate Nation, I just want to thank you so much for listening and I will see you next time. Thank you for listening to Elevate. If you enjoy this episode, be sure to rate, review, subscribe, and pay it forward by sharing with a friend. Most importantly, take this opportunity to elevate your results by taking immediate action on what you learned. For more, visit elevatepod.com.